So it's my great pleasure to present my research. Oh, uh, speak louder. Okay, great. Let me try to adjust this position. Is this better? Okay, great. So I'm a UCLA faculty here, and I'm in the Department of Statistics. And my research group is called the Junction of Statistics and Biology. The reason is that our focus is at this junction. And also another reason is that my last name is just so common, so I don't want to call my lab name using my last name. That's not distinctive. So anyway, so this is a logo of our lab, uh, thanks to a former member, Dr. Becky Lin, for designing this for us. So you can see it's JSB together. So we try to build a bridge between statistics and biology. And what I'm going to talk about today is some examples of how we did. And also, how to enhance statistical rigor in genomic data science is a recent focus in my lab. So why is the rigor challenging in genomic data science? So I listed three reasons here, and there can be more. So first, we know that in genomics, the data types are new, right? We have new technologies coming up, and the data types are complex and diverse. And as a result, the technology moves so fast, so the computational method development needs to catch up. So it's very rapid, leaving us very little time to think carefully. And also, there's a gap or gaps between scientific questions and data science formulations. So I'm going to show one example for this as a teaser of my talk. It's about how to predict cancer driver genes. So this is a cell paper from 2012, which tackled this task of cancer driver gene prediction. And the data they use is actually this matrix, where rows are genes and columns are features. So these features could be genomic features of genes, right? how many mutations they contain, for example. So we have some knowledge about some genes being cancer drivers, so I label them as blue, and other genes being non-cancer drivers in red, but these are only a small proportion of all genes. So most of the genes are in gray, so we don't know they are cancer drivers or not. So what's in this paper is essentially this p-value calculation approach. So let me talk a little bit. So to calculate the p-value for every gene, what they did is first to examine every feature, every column here, let's say feature 4. So they use the non-cancer driver genes, those red genes, their values in feature 4 to form a null distribution for this feature. And then for every other gene, they use this gene's value in feature 4 to get a p-value, so which is calculated as a, the right tail probability, which is the proportion of null values that are greater than gene A's value. So therefore, for gene A, in feature 4, we have a p-value. Using this approach to all the features for gene A, we would have d p-values for gene A, because we have a total of d features. So how do we combine this into one p-value for gene A? They use Fisher's method to get one p-value. And then using this whole procedure to every gene, we can obtain a p-value for every gene. And then they apply the benjamini hochberg procedure for FDR control. So that's the procedure. But what I saw two issues in this procedure. First of all, the Fisher's method requires that p-values are independent but we know here the features, and many of them are constructed by human. So they are likely correlated. So that independence assumption becomes questionable. And the second thing is, in the p-value calculation here, the method defines p-values as one-sided p-value. I said greater than, right? Proportion of null values greater than the gene is value. But what if the significance lies in two tails? That's not considered. And also, I wonder why do we need to go through such a complicated procedure to get a p-value? And you can see that here, the cancer driver genes, those blue genes, are not directly reused. So realizing these questions, I think this problem should be better formulated as a binary classification problem, which can naturally take multiple features into account. We can see the cancer driver genes as one class, 
non-cancer driver genes as another class, then we can train a classifier. And then for every unknown gene, we can apply the classifier to it. Then we can predict whether it's a cancer driver genes or not. So in this way, all the feature dependencies will be taken into account by the classifier. I think it's more natural and easier. So realizing this, actually I have to say, I learned about this problem from my collaborator, Dr. Whaley's lab in UC Irvine. So we applied this binary classification approach to their paper, which was published in Science Advances. And basically the conceptual advance here is to include epigenetic features into cancer driver gene prediction, because the previous work only used genomic features, not epigenetic features. But besides this conceptual advance, we also changed the computational formulation from multiple testing to binary classification, as I said. And also motivated by this, I and my collaborator, Dr. Xin Tong at USC, he's a statistician, we co-authored this paper trying to distinguish the hypothesis testing, which is a statistical inference framework with binary classification, which is a machine learning framework. What are their differences and similarities? And how do we choose between the two when we formulate a real data problem? So we try to do the clarification. But here in short is that Hypothesis testing are concerning questions regarding features, while binary classification is concerning questions regarding observations or instances. That's the key difference. So this is a teaser, and I'll move to my main part. So we have seen that the previous cell paper used the multiple testing formulation, although I questioned that, but in genomic data science, many tasks are multiple testing. So in multiple testing, two criteria play the key role, and they need calibration. The first one we have seen, p-value. So what is required for a valid p-value is that if the p-values are from the null hypothesis, they should form, they should follow a uniform distribution between zero and one. This is a sanity check that's needed. And for theoretical consideration, we may relax this uniform to be super uniform. This will make us more conservative, but we can still control the type one error. And when we look at many tests together, we have many p-values. Then one criterion that takes into account all the tests is the FDR, false discovery rate, which has been the most popular criterion since it was proposed in 1995. So for false discovery rate, it is actually defined under what we call the frequentist st statistics paradigm. So it is an expectation of a ratio. And the ratio is the proportion of false discoveries among our discoveries. So our discoveries are the rejections, right? Among the rejections we made, how many are false rejections? That can give us the ratio. But we should be aware that, first of all, this ratio is not observed because in real data, we don't know which discoveries are false. And second, on one data set, we only have one ratio this expectation is taken over all possible data sets. So this is what we call frequentist. Although we only have one data, but we think about all possible data. So therefore, you can imagine how difficult it is to control this unobservable quantity, FDR. However, the Benjamin Hodgeberg is a very smart strategy for controlling the FDR by setting a threshold on the p-values, as long as the p-values are valid. So I want to talk about three common causes of EU post p-values I've seen over my career. <laughs> I have to see that, say that some of the examples were my doubts when I was a PhD student. So the first example is about whether the problem is a two sample test or a one sample test. So this is a very common task for analyzing chip seq data. So in chip seq data, we often have one, this is a genome browser track from experimental condition, another from background condition. Here, the y-axis is actually the read coverage. So the larger the coverage, the more likely this region is a peak. But we know that the genome is not uniform, so we also need to consider some background noise from just some random measurements. So therefore, we need to do the comparison. And here, for example, this blue, this red thing is likely a peak because the read coverage in the experimental condition is much higher than the read coverage in the background condition. 
and ChIP-seq measures protein binding sites to DNA. So for ChIP-seq data, the MAX and HOMER are two very popular methods. You can see the number of citations. And I read about this MAX paper when I was a graduate student, and I became very, I would say, um, curious about their p-value calculation. So let's, let's take a look. So this is my own summary of their complicated procedure, but I tried to grab the statistical part. So in their formulation, we look at one region, and this region has a read count in the background sample, a count in the experimental sample. So we consider both counts as random variables. And for each count, we have one realization. So these are the observations. So the formula in max is essentially the probability that this big Y, random variable Y, is larger or equal than the observed realization small y under the assumption, the null hypothesis, that y follows Poisson distribution with parameter as small x. Is this a correct p-value? Right, it's not something I have seen in my textbook. So I was very curious. But thinking about this more carefully, I don't think so. The reason is because if we write this in terms of null hypothesis, this is essentially that assuming this y random variable follows Poisson with parameter lambda, the null hypothesis is lambda equals small x, alternative is lambda greater than small x. This can justify why the p-value takes this formula. However, what's wrong in this null hypothesis? It involves the small x which is itself random. But we know that in our textbook, the null hypothesis should only involve constants, right? There's no randomness there. This is not the case. So essentially, this problem ignores the randomness in the background data, treating this as fixed, and only considered experimental count as the random sample. So it's using doing a one sample test, but essentially we need a two sample test. But I didn't have a solution or fix when I was a student. <laughs> because how could we perform a two sample test when the sample size is only one versus one? In our textbook, we talk about sample size, we need multiple samples, right, under each condition. One versus one seems something not statistical. P-value calculation is difficult unless we assume like Poisson distribution. But I realized that later, I would say maybe <laughs> three years ago, four years ago, p-values are just intermediates for FDR control in large sample multiple testing. They are not our final target. We, we care about FDR, not the intermediate p-values. So therefore, I think we need something in our genomic data science to simplify the problem so that we could directly control the FDR without worrying too much about how to obtain p-values or how to obtain valid and high resolution p-values. So I'll elaborate on our work on this in the later part of this talk. The second issue of EOPOS p-values is the misspecification of a parametric model that does not fit data well. So this is another popular task in genomics, identifying differential express genes from bulk RNA-seq data. And the two most popular software packages are EdgeR and DC2. So you can see there are a number of citations. And they were developed for small sample sizes. So when RNA-seq was first developed in 2008, the sample sizes are not big because of expensive costs. So usually we have only three replicates under each condition. So the sample sizes are three versus three. And of course, we can imagine this wouldn't give us a good power for identifying differential express genes. So in this cartoon, every column is one gene, every row is one sample or one replicate. So we want to compare these three values and these three values for this gene and these three values and these three for the other gene. So intuitively, we may say, oh, the left gene is differential expressed as DEG. The right one is not DEG. So to increase the power, right, these two methods have a common parametric assumption. That is, every gene follows a negative binomial distribution under each condition. However, you could imagine we only have three points it's not possible to check whether this negative binomial holds or not. We just have to assume it. But now we have large sample sizes from population scale data. And this is, again, in collaboration with Dr. Wadi's lab at UC Irvine. So this is an immunotherapy data set from a cell paper. We can see that if we put 
patients into two groups before treatment, on treatment, the sample sizes are 51 and 58. So using this sample size, we could actually check the negative binomial assumption. However, assuming that we just follow the strategy as everybody else was doing, apply the popular method to D6 to an HR, and the, the red dots are the number of D genes found from this two group comparison. And we just want to say, what if we permute these individuals to just shuffle the labels and what will happen? But I have to say, we first found this by coincidence, but the results were very shocking. This bar shows the average number of D genes found by d 6 hr across many permuted datasets. And also this error bar shows the standard error of the number of D genes. So what this suggests is that on many permuted datasets, more D genes were found than the method found from the origin, original data. And then this is clearly not something we would expect, right? And we also tried other two popular methods, lemma view, which is doing better, and NOIC is a non-parametric method used in the GTEC consortium. It's not that severe, but you can see it can find, it could find many DGs from permitted data. So what's the reason? Our first thought is to check the negative binomial model. Does it fit well? The answer is what we expected. It didn't fit well to the genes that were frequently identified from permitted data. We can see that. So the larger the value, the poorness the fit. And for the genes that were rarely identified from permitted data, their fitness for negative binomial is much better. So you can see that the model fitting does play a role. If the model, parametric model doesn't fit well, then using it to do statistical tests is not, it's no longer meaningful. And what's more severe about this, you know, middle model misspecification, a language statisticians tend to use, is that if we use the D genes found by D6 and HR and run the Go gene ontology analysis or functional analysis, we can see that many of these genes are actually related to immune responses. So therefore, if we trust the result and report the result, we are likely to say that between the, the two groups of patients, there are indeed differences in their immune responses. However, these genes can be frequently found from permuted data, which means that this conclusion is not as strong as it should be. So in our paper, we found that if the sample size is large enough, and we should just use the non-parametric approach. And if there are no other covariates to adjust, then Wilcoxon rank some tests will be a very natural classical choice to go. And it doesn't have this issue. So no genes found from original data, no genes found from permitted data. So the take home message for here is that we shouldn't just choose a method based on popularity. Understanding the application domains of different methods is crucial. So that's why data analysis can never be automatic, in my opinion, because we need a lot of subjective judgments. And our recommendation for large sample size data is that it's important to do sanity check. So in our case, permutation is a simple sanity check. But in other cases, you may design a more complicated way to shuffle your data in a way to create some no data to serve as a negative control. And I will show more examples of this later. And also, we can consider non-parametric tests because there's no need to stick with restricted parametric assumptions when we have enough data. So this is our paper, and there are more, data, more results and more details there. However, if we don't have large sample size data, what can we do? Can we, we have to stick with parametric model for power, but can we actually make the false discovery rate control easier or more and more transparent. So I'll talk about our Clipper work later. And the third issue for EO post p-values is the mistreatment of inferred covariates as observed. So this is a very common issue in single cell data analysis. So I'm going to talk about this example, which is about identifying differential expressed genes along cell pseudotime that is inferred from the same data. So cell pseudotime is a latent temporal variable that would reflect a cell's relative status among all cells. 
So the task of inferring pseudo time is called pseudo time inference, also known as trajectory inference. The goal is to estimate the pseudo time of cells by ordering cells along some inferred trajectory. And the trajectory is going to be built based on these cells' RNA-seq data, based on their transcriptome similarity. So popular softwares, there are many softwares I'm just listening to. Monaco is the first paper that proposed this concept, pseudo time. And Slingshot has been a popular method. And this is an a illustration from Slingshot. So you can see that in the two-dimensional PC, principal component space, we have the cells as dots, and the cells are pre-clusters, in clustered in different colors. So the first step in Slingshot is to build a minimum spanning tree of cell clusters. And next, it will try to smooth out the, the tree branches using the principal curves. And finally, it will project every cell to its closest principal curve. So in this case here, we will have two trajectories. And within each trajectory, the cells will receive a pseudo time. So normally, the pseudo time will be normalized between 0 and 1. So if this is 0, this is 1. So every cell will receive a value between 0 and 1 in this trajectory. And some cells will receive pseudo time in the other trajectory. So that's the pseudo time inference problem. But obtaining the pseudo time is only the first step. We want to know the biology. And the reason we do pseudo time inference is that we expect the pseudo time reflects some differential process or developmental process or immune response process. So we would, not, we would like to know which genes have expression changes along the process. Then these genes may be important. So on this real data, here we expect the pseudo time to reflect immune response. Then the left gene, looking at the scatters, right? The y-axis are the gene expression. Every dot is a cell. We would expect the left gene to be called differentially expressed because it has this elevation expression value. And we would expect the right one not to be called differential expressed because it's relatively flat. That's the intuition. How do we find those genes? And I have to say that existing methods would try to do this task using regression. This is the y, this is the x. We do a regression and see whether x can explain y. Right? That's the intuition. However, I want to say that here the pseudo time is not observed, but inferred from the same data. If we consider the data to be random, like here, if we consider y to be random, then the x is also random. So we can show this by just showing the sampling variance using subsampling. So looking at these cells, and this is simulation data, so it's very clean. It has this trajectory. If we just randomly take a subsample of cells, do the pseudo time inference, then that set, the cells in the subsample will receive pseudo time values. And then across many, many subsamples, for every cell here in the row, we can collect its pseudo time values in the subsamples that include it. And we can see there is a spread. That suggests that the pseudo time values would depend on what other cells are included, right? So it's not a constant for every cell, but it's random and it's subject to sampling randomness. Okay, so like I said, existing methods treat pseudo time as an observed covariate due regression. So our solution for this is that we propose a method called pseudo time DE to consider the uncertainty of pseudo time inference. So I'll quickly talk about what we did. So this is the diagram of pseudo time DE. So for the regression part, like between a gene and the cell pseudo time, we use this model called generalized additive model, which can, can be considered as the nonlinear version of the generalized linear model, GLM. So this model can capture nonlinear relationship between the mean and the covariate. So starting from the real data of a group of cells, the first step is to do pseudo time inference so every cell can receive a pseudo time. And this step can be done by any inference methods, like what I said, monocle 3 or slingshot. So with a pseudo time, existing method would just run the regression. So for every gene J, we take its expression values as Y, pseudo time as X, we do the regression, we obtain a test statistic and try to give the p-value. Right, so we know for the GAN model, it has a theoretical null distribution for the test statistic. So there's a theoretical p-value. But our point is that that theoretical null distribution consider 
x as fixed, but here x is random, so it shouldn't hold anymore. And what we did is trying to use the top route to get an empirical distribution for the test statistic. So to capture the sampling variability, we use we do self subsampling of cells. We didn't do bootstrap because some pseudotime inference methods don't allow repetitive cells. So subsampling is the only option. We do 80% or 90% cell subsampling. On each subsample, we perform pseudotime inference. Then the subsampling variability in the pseudotime will be taken into account. And to create the null values for our test statistic, we need to make sure this gene J has no relationship with pseudotime. So therefore, we, we actually permute the cells to disrupt the relationship between pseudotime and gene J. So with the permuted data, we fit the same regression model, the GAN model. So for the data generating part, we consider both negative binomial or zero inflated negative binomial. So with the fitted model on those subsampled permuted data, we can obtain no values for the same test statistic. Then, compare, then comparing the actual test statistic value to the null distribution, we can obtain a p-value. So you can see that we try to incorporate pseudotime inference as part of our procedure. While in previous methods, they take pseudotime as given, as observed, and they only do the regression. Okay, and we can show that using our approach, the p-values are better calibrated. It follows the uniform 0 to 1 distribution, while other methods have different degrees of issue. And we can also show that with the well-calibrated p-values, we can actually find more goal terms enriched in the differential express genes. And I'm not showing the results here, but the goal terms are actually biologically relevant. So it shows that with the p-value calculation, we can not only control the FDR, but we may also have power gain. Okay, but I have to say that the pseudotime DE as, yeah. Sorry, this new X slide and just to kind of clarify something, one more slide, yeah. So here, uh, supposing that gene G was actually used to compute the pseudotime in the beginning. Yeah. Yeah, that's a very good point. Actually, that's the thing we are trying to fix. So, and, and actually, we'll, we'll, you, I'll talk about that in the limitation slide. So basically, the, the whole idea is that if there is a strong rate, there is a strong pseudotime, the cells follow a trajectory. Mm -hmm. And if the gene J is a non, is a no gene, then you can imagine gene J will be largely irrelevant to the pseudotime. Right, so that's why in this case we can say that it's fine that this test statistic should approximately be from this null distribution because the permutation will make them independent. Yeah, but the issue is that if the cells don't have any pseudotime at all, then the the pseudotime in first pseudotime may randomly depend on a gene J, even though the gene J is still null D, is still non D E, and that dependence will actually make the p-value problematic. So that's the thing we're trying to fix, and it's actually a limitation of the existing method. Basically, the existing method is trying to say that we assume there is a strong pseudotime there. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, so first of all, the, the obvious limitation is computational time, because you can imagine that in order to obtain a p-value in the resolution of 0 0.001, we need 10, 1,000 rounds of subsampling, pseudotime inference, and permutation. That can be computationally intensive. So we want to reduce the number of rounds of this permutation subsampling while still achieving FDR control. And then the Clipper method I'm going to talk right after this will be the solution we propose. And the second thing is what I just said. What if the cells don't follow trajectory at all in the complete null case? How do we deal with that? Then in this case, we need a way to generate the null cells to serve as a negative control. And for this, I'm going to talk about our simulator, SA Design 3, for achieving this. Okay, besides the pseudotime DE task, another more common task is clustering followed by DE. Right, we first cluster cells and then identify differential expressed genes between cell clusters. 
People realize this issue and call this issue double dipping. So two methods are existing and they assume genes follow Gaussian distributions. So these two methods use the selective inference framework um, proposed by the Stanford group statisticians. And they have to assume this Gaussian distribution to achieve some closed form formula for the null distribution. Or also from Daniela Witten's group in U Washington, they proposed this count splitting method, which was posted a week ago. So I think in this count splitting method, we are still trying to understand it and we will do a comparison with it. But in my understanding, the count splitting method assumes, just as their previous cluster p val method, they assume cells are fixed as well as the genes. So we have the fixed N cells and P genes, and what's random are the entries in the count matrix. While in our formulation, it's different in that we assume the cells as random observations. So I think that's a key conceptual difference, but we will do actual comparison on real data. So our proposal is to use the clipper for controlling FDR without relying on high resolution p-values. And we want to use the SA Design 3 simulator to generate the corresponding null data. So whatever null hypothesis we are, we have the right setup null data so we can do a contrast. So I have to acknowledge that this idea is inspired by the gap statistic work from also Stanford statisticians Tipshrani Hasty and about setting up a null control for, for deciding number of clusters and also the knockoff literature for doing this contrast without relying on high resolution p-values. So this is what I've said so far. I talk about three common causes of EU post p-values. So now I'm going to quickly go over the basic idea of Clipper. So the theoretical foundation is the knockoff literature. This formula is from that paper. So basically, what we aim to do is that for every feature, and this is a multiple testing problem, so we have D features, we want to set up a contrast score, one per feature, and pooling the contrast score together. So this is across all features. We want to find the threshold T such that this ratio is under the FDR threshold Q, which is likely 5%. So what does this ratio mean? You can consider this as an empirical estimator of the false discovery rate, FDR. So let's say you imagine this dashed line is T, and by symmetry, we have a negative T here. So you can think about this numerator roughly as the left tail left to the negative T, and the denominator as the right tail right of T. So we are basically imagining that if all the features are null features, their contrast score should be symmetric about zero. But for some features that are not null, we would like their contrast scores to be large and positive. So we will have a heavy right tail. So therefore, the right tail will be the discoveries. But by symmetry, the left tail would be the false positives or false discoveries. So this is the basic idea from the FDR control theory in the knockoff paper. But what's different between what we do here and in the knockoff paper is that knockoff is in a multivariate prediction framework. So it, it needs to consider the dependence of all the features. When in our case, we are examining one feature at a time. So we are doing this marginal screening for interesting features. And the DE gene analysis is one example. We look at one gene at a time. We're not not putting all genes into a joint prediction framework. I think that's the key difference. And we show that this idea is actually very general beyond the knockoff framework because it can be applied to the chip seek p calling I talked about in the beginning, RNA seek differential expression gene identification, pseudo time DE, and cluster DE, the two single cell tasks. And one more common I want to say is that the symmetry, which means that if a feature is null, then its sign, positive or negative, is independent of its absolute value. This assumption is analogous to the uniform 0 to 1 assumption for p-values. And so these, both assumptions are needed, right? So for either framework, you need one assumption to ensure FDR control. So this allows us to just worry about the contrast score construction. And we don't need to worry about how to convert a contrast score into a high resolution p-value, which is what we need using the p-value based approach. Okay, so this is one slide just to say what the method can do. So for the chipsy p-calling, we can just take the experimental condition data as the target data 
the background condition data as the null data, then we can do a contrast. So here I'm using the notation T as a general notation for a function or a complex pipeline. So whatever procedure you apply to your target data, you apply the same procedure to null data. And you just need to make sure that if there's no essential difference between target data and null data, then the, the result can be half of the time positive, half of the time negative. That's the thing you need to make sure. And for RNA-seq D gene identification I showed before, the actual data is target data, and the permitted data is the null data, because there's no more relationship. For pseudotime DE, cluster DE, actual data is target data, and we need a way to simulate the null data using our simulator. Okay, so this is some results from our Clipper paper, just a quick show. So we can see that for the ChIP-CP calling used with Homer and Max2 as an add-on, as a downstream step for, for defining contrast score based on their output, we can reduce the actual FDR in our semi-synthetic data while still maintaining relatively good power. For RNA-seq used with D-seq2 and HR, when the sample sizes are small, like 3 and 3, and Wilcoxon doesn't apply, we can show that using Clipper, we can reduce the FDR while maintaining good power. So how about the single cell data, right? What's the null data? So this is the Clipper paper. You can check for more details. The last piece, I will quickly talk about the single cell simulator. So we previously had this simulator essay design 2 for simulating single cell RNA-seq data from discrete cell types. So we would like to fit a multi-gene probabilistic parametric model for every cell type. So the key in essay design 2 is to use this technique called copula to capture gene-gene correlations. And for every gene marginally, we would model its count distribution using either Poisson, negative binomial, or their zero inflated versions. So that's essay design two, and we can show that the copula plays a crucial role because this is the data used for fitting the model. This is the left out data untouched for validation. This is the synthetic data. Without copula, the data will look, look like this. So the, the clusters will be like spheres and they will be not capturing the shapes within cell type. And we also compare to ZimWave and SparseSim, although they don't have explicit modeling for gene-gene correlations, but it's, it's possible that they can capture gene correlations. So that's why, why we included them here. But compared to them, our synthetic data are more realistic. But SA Design 2 can only generate data from discrete cell types. So in our current version, SA Design 3, we can generate cells from continuous trajectories. Like here, you see that for SA Design 2, we need to pre-cluster cells before generation. So you can see some small gaps here and here. But for SA Design 3, the cells are more continuous as the real data. And furthermore, we have extended our feature modalities from RNA only to ATAC-seq protein, and also we can include spatial coordinates to generate spatial omics data. And finally, we use the technique called vine copula to be able to extract a likelihood from the fitted model. Then we can use likelihood to do model selection. For example, we can compare to like whether the data can be better described by this pseudotime method or the other pseudotime method. We can compare your qualities. So this is just an example showing that we can generate data from this tr bifurcation trajectory, starting from here, one trajectory on top, one on the bottom. And compared to other like single cell, like single cell GAN, the deep learning method, we can generate data more realistically. And also we can generate multi-omics data. Let's say we start from real data with RNA only and methylation only, then depending on any the integration method, we can use the integrated result to generate synthetic data. So now for every cell, we can have both RNA and methylation. Then we can use this to check the self-consistency of an integration method. Because if that method is consistent, then using the data split RNA and methylation, then they should recover this truth. And this is how we work for spatial data. And finally, um, Guang Ao, who is also here, my student, has develop a functionality for generating reads, not just the count. So we can also provide the read level data for benchmarking low-level low tools. 
So this is a cartoon diagram showing what we can do. We can generate data from multiple cell states, from multi-omics, and also multiple experimental design, including like age, gender, covariates, two conditions, or even batches with batch effects. And for we can use S Design 3 not just as a simulator, but also as an interpretable model. So we can do inference to infer the cell type differences, pseudo time spatial coordinate changes, and also we can provide the BIC, Bayesian Information Criterion, for comparing models. And also we can generate null data by doing model alteration. By changing parameters in the model, we can generate null. This is one example. So let's say this is the real data in clustered in two clusters, right? If we simply do permutation, you can see that even though the labels are shuffled, but the cells still have this clustering shape. If we want to create a null where there's no clusters at all, we can use SC Design 3 by changing the fit and model parameters. Now you see the cells are in one sphere and there's no clear separation. So showing that, we can show that this can avoid the double dipping issue where there's no cell clusters, but we use an algorithm, clustering algorithm, to force the cells into two clusters and find differential expressions. This is a popular pipeline surat. This is k-means clustering. So we can see that if we apply them to find two clusters, they can do the job. But here the two clusters are not really meaningful. But still, if we don't know that and we try to find DE genes, we can always find DE genes between the two clusters. That's natural because the clusters were defined by the genes. But if we use our strategy to generate null data, we can see that here the null data will look like real data because the real data doesn't have clusters. So therefore, if in that example, if we apply the CRAP pipeline with statistical tests, the FDR is actually one because we can, it can always find DE genes, but there's no clusters. However, using our strategy, doing the contrast between real data and null data, and use Clipper for FDR control, we can control the FDR very well. So these are all my contents. To summarize, I just want to emphasize that the first step is should a scientific question, how the formulation should be, right? Should a scientific question be formulated as a multiple testing? That's my teaser. If so, then I talk about three common causes of EO post p values. It's about whether it's a two sample test or a one sample test, whether the parametric model fits data well, and whether the covariates are inferred from the same data. And finally, I talk about this Clipper's flexibility for doing the contrast. As long as we have target data, null data, then no matter how complex the pipeline is, we can apply the same pipeline to both data to do a contrast. But we have some remaining questions to optimize. First is how do we optimize the contrast score? There may be multiple choices. And how many null data can we generate? So in all the examples I talk about for single cell data, we only generate data for once because of computational efficiency. But for power gain, we may want to do this for multiple times. Then James' work here for the, multi, for the multiple knockoff would be relevant for the power gain. And we are currently trying to implement Clipper in bioinformatics tools for it to be used. And my postdoc Shinjo here is doing that. And for SCN3, we, we expect it to be a very versatile tool for benchmarking, given single cell has so many methods, right? I think this number can be updated now. So we hope to make it useful. So these are the papers in my talk today. And finally, for our students here, if you are interested in learning more about GAN and Copulus, these two books are very nice introductions. So finally, I want to thank my collaborator, Dr. Wei Li, and his postdoc Yu Mei at UC Irvine, because I think the first two projects I talked about today were from our collaboration. So without the conversation, I wouldn't know these problems, and there are statistical issues. And also my group members, Tian Yi for S Design 2, and Dong Yuan for pseudo time D, pseudo -time D and SD93, and Guang Ao for generating the reads, and Xinzhou for Clipper, and Ke Xing who tried to develop this combination of SD3 and Clipper, and also the funding agencies. Thank you.